Yeah, so, hello, I'm Christian Stevenson with the Mississippi State University Extension Service in Hancock County, uh, joining you today by Zoom to talk about garden soil, uh, preparing it, uh, understanding all the components of it, and how we can improve it. So, what we are looking for, uh, when we look at garden soil, is uh, what we want is soil that is going to have the proper structure, have all the nutrients that we need to grow healthy crops. Uh, and there's a word for that. The, the word for that healthy soil is soil that is in good tilth. Uh, so a soil that is in good tilth is going to be loamy, uh, be rich in all of the nutrients that we need, have a mixture of sand and clay and organic matter, uh, it's going to prevent compaction. And the truth is that ideal soil is, is kind of rarely available. Uh, so often it's incumbent upon us as gardeners to take action to improve the soil that we have. Uh, and as long as we are willing to take some steps to overcome the basic shortcomings of some of our soils, all the plants that we're trying to grow are going to be able to grow in those soils. So we want to start off at the very beginning. We have an area of our lawn uh, that we want to turn into a vegetable garden. And one of the first things we want to do is to remove that grass. We don't want that sod there. It's in our way. Uh, and there are a couple of different tools that we can use to do this. Now, uh, I have used a shovel or a spade to remove soil from the, uh, uh, from the area of a garden that I've wanted to put in a number of times. It can be very labor intensive. Uh, there are also specialized tools specifically for removing sod. Uh, up there in the top image, you can see a, a mechanical push version of that sod remover uh, that can still be a little bit labor intensive. Uh, but you can also rent or purchase, if you desire to, uh, a sod remover that, that has a motor that's going to make that task a lot easier. So uh, what we don't, don't want to do is we don't want to just take that sod and just till it into the soil. Uh, oftentimes the thatch layer that's going to be there is going to make it really difficult to establish a good seed bed. And we may wind up with clumps of grass just sprouting up in the middle of our garden and make it, making it difficult to manage. Uh, so these sod strippers are gonna make that work a lot easier. Oh, they're also going to allow us to preserve that soil. And what we wanna do is we wanna save that strip sod because that's going to be a good source of compost that we can then add into the garden later. And I'm going to put in a, a brief advertisement for the programs next week because I will be doing a full presentation just on composting uh, that I encourage you to come to. Uh, so what we want to do with that side is set it off the side, uh, soil side up, uh, add a sprinkling of ammonium sulfate, which is a, just a nitrogen fertilizer between the stacks of this uh, sod and cover all of it. Uh, and that's going to kill the sod. It's also going to really start that process of decomposition down into compost that we can then add back into the garden area. Now, a question I get really often is where can I purchase soil to be brought into my garden? And just, I want to till in this better soil or you know, use that rather than work with the soil that I have. And really oftentimes, it's a lot better to work with the soil that you have rather than trying to haul something else in. Now, one of the, the things that's behind that is with the soil we have, we at least know what conditions we're in. We know what our problems are, and we're going to know how we're going to be able to address those. So with hauling in soil, you're also hauling in any of the potential problems that may come with that. Uh, it may include weeds, uh, may include insects or plant diseases that aren't already there, and you're just hauling in additional problems. Now, it is possible if you have a rocky area or an area with coarse gravel, 
that you may need to raise up the level of an area of your yard, and so you may need to bring in fill. Uh, just keep in mind that you, you, again, may be bringing in some other problems. So as much as we can, we want to work with the soil that's native to that area rather than bringing something in. Uh, another question I get uh, is, you know, is my soil ready for me to till it up? Uh, and there's a very simple, easy, easy test for this to see if the soil is ready to work at the beginning of the spring. And we don't want to work our soil too soon because that can cause some problems with clumping and make the soil really difficult to work with. Occasionally you'll hear terms like adobe soil or gumbo soils. And very often that's actually a response to the way that we've treated the soil rather than the nature of the soil itself. So you can dig a hole, take a handful of the soil from about a three inch depth, squeeze it firmly in your hand and drop it onto a hard surface like a sidewalk. Uh, and what should happen is that ball should shatter. Um, if it does shatter, great, it, it's time to go ahead and till up that area of ground. Uh, if not, uh, we want to leave it be for a little bit, while, a little bit longer or we're going to wind up with a lot of hard clods and we may need to uh, do some improvements and if we have really good soil, if we've done the right improvements to our soil, we are going to be able to till a little bit earlier. And I just have a, a picture there at the top. Of course, I am uh, speaking from South Mississippi. Uh, we, don't get hard for, we don't get that kind of hard frost and snow very often. Uh, so that picture, of course, is, is not from down here. Uh, but that is uh, seriously too early to be working in the soil. Uh, now, once that soil has dried sufficiently, we can spade it or rototill it to a depth of about six to eight inches. And keep in mind, we don't need to have soil that's flower fine. It doesn't need to be that fine. We can leave in those marble-sized particles, uh, and that's actually going to break up the soil a, a, a bit. Uh, and prevent a little bit of uh, problems of crusting. When water interacts with the surface of that soil, we don't want it to form a crust, uh, and having those pebbles or, or uh, little particles is going to help. Uh, keep in mind, you may have some clods that you need to pulverize, uh, and you do want it to be level uh, so that it produces a really good firm seed bed. Uh, that uh, is also really going to help with making sure that we get good uniform water penetration down into the soil. Um, so as I'm sure you've often heard, there are different kinds of soils. Uh, and uh, here we often find ourselves in a situation where we have clay or we have sand. Uh, and and not, a lot of, not a lot of space in between. Uh, and clay soils, really small, fine particles, uh, have the ability to hold moisture well, um, and oftentimes they wind up uh, not percolating well, so they might hold moisture and stay wet too well. Um, those clay soils often do have quite a lot of nutrients in them. Um, so because of the way they hold water, they may dry slowly in the spring, making planting early really difficult, and water penetration may be slow. So a lot of times when we water, that water just winds up running off to the side, rather than entering down where the, in the root zone where the plants need it. In contrast to that, we have sandy soils, really easy to work with. They tend to be lighter. Sand is a really large particle. Um, but because of all the space between those particles, water just passes through those soils really, really quickly. And because of that, as we get into later season and it gets really hot, uh, oftentimes plants are going to suffer from moisture stress. And the nutrients can actually be lost as that irrigation water just moves downward through the soil. So both of these problems can be corrected by taking the same action. So whether you have a soil that has too much clay or a soil that has too much sand, the answer is the addition of organic matter. So what that organic matter does is separate out those clay particles uh, kind of, you know, just pushes them apart, uh, or it can, you know, fill in the space between sand particles, uh, and so it increases the space between clay, increases the watering, water holding capacity of sandy soils, 
And as that organic matter breaks down, it continues to have soil improving characteristics, not the least in that it, it contains nutrients that are valuable to plants. Uh, so in order to do this, we want to start by incorporating about two to three inches of organic matter, six to eight inches down into the soil. Uh, keep in mind that organic matter is going to decompose. It's not going to last forever. So we do need to add that in about two more inches each year. And if you have an extraordinarily heavy soil, it may take some time of doing this to actually see the improvement that we want. Um, you can speed things along and help out by adding in summer mulches or compost as we're actually going through the season, because that's again, that same organic material, it's integrating in with the soil, and you can see the improvement in your soil structure by the addition of those organic materials. So there are a lot of different organic materials out there. And what we wanna look for is a material we're going to be able to use a lot of, that's not going to break the bank when we're trying to, uh, to purchase it. So looking at a few of the different options for organic material, uh, a lot of us have oak trees, uh, other deciduous trees in our landscape, so leaves from these deciduous trees. We can gather those up in the fall and compost them down uh, and then incorporate them in the soil. Uh, very similarly, the needles from pine trees and other conifers can be used. Uh, another really common one is the use of bark or wood shavings. Uh, one of the advantages there is they're really unlikely to contain uh, weed seeds. Uh, on the commercial side of things, rather than something that you might go out and gather, uh, peat moss is a product that's a really excellent material. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more later. Very high in organic matter. It is kind of acidic, um, but for the amount of material that you're using, uh, if you're in an in-the-ground garden rather than containers or small raised beds, peat moss can just be prohibitively expensive. A, a common organic matter that is used for uh, gardening and improving soils is manure. Uh, it can come from a variety of animal sources. Uh, and sort of the, the great thing about manure is that it's going to come with a lot of nutrients that are going to be really valuable to plant growth uh, if you're using enough of it. Uh, but do keep in mind, you really want that manure to be composted. You don't want to use it fresh because it's possible it contains weed seeds uh, that have survived through the digestive system of the animal. Um, and it is um, additionally uh, possible uh, that sometimes uh, it's, it's come up that uh, herbicides used in a, uh, a pasture environment have survived into manure that wasn't composted, uh, and that has led to the, some damage to some gardens that I've seen. Uh, I did have a question about composting of cedar. Uh, I don't generally recommend it, um, because the cedar has uh, a lot of uh, chemicals going on in it, and just natural things that are in the wood uh, that can be a, a little bit difficult to work with. Um, but as long as it's composted down thoroughly, it would be okay. Uh, another material that you can use is straw. Uh, depending on the kind, you, you, can need to, you may need to watch out for weed problems. Uh, and that's pine straw and wheat straw. Um, there are a variety of different kinds of things that we, we kind of all group together as straw. Uh, some uh, grass clippings or green manure crops, things like clovers, uh, even our kitchen vegetable gardens, uh, garden trimmings, we can use those. Uh, just keep in mind that really a lot of that material is just water. Um, so they don't produce a lot of long-term uh, soil improvement. Uh, we can absolutely use grass clippings. Again, a product that you want to compost for a little bit, let it break down, let some of that water get out. Uh, because if you apply too much at one time, because it contains all that water, if you apply very much, any more than about a half inch layer, um, it winds up getting slimy uh, and really unpleasant.
Uh, so large quantities of uh, mature wood type products like sawdust or leaves or straw are going to potentially produce a nitrogen deficiency in the plants um, as the, uh, because of the high amount of carbon in them. Uh, as they're breaking down, uh, some of the nitrogen that's there uh, gets uh, used up by the action of bacteria in the soil, the good bacteria that are operating there. Uh, so along with that compost or as you're composting material, it's a really good idea to add in a nitrogen fertilizer uh, or add in a nitrogen fertilizer directly incorporated into your soil uh, just to avoid that problem. Uh, so uh, there are some things that we want to make sure of. We are adding in a lot of soil fertility by adding in these manures or plant residues, uh, but we're not necessarily adding the right balance of nutrients that we would need in order to get everything we would want for the growth of our plants. It's also possible, particularly with manures, that we can see an a accumulation of salt in the soil that can be damaging to plant growth. Uh, and the uh, best $8 you can spend in horticulture is the answer to this, soil testing, uh, which of course is done through Mississippi State University Extension. And I am gonna show you the website for that um, here in just a second uh, to kind of give you a, a little bit of practical uh, uh, advice, at least show you the resource that's available on the Extension website. Uh, so for soil testing, there's a kit available from every county Extension office. Um, you can just bring your soil in in a, a plastic bag or whatever else is convenient. Uh, when you take that soil sample, you do want to go down to about a depth of six inches um, and get the uh, sample from about 15 or 20 different areas around your entire landscape um, so that we kind of get a balance of all of those areas. So if one area might have something strange going on with it, having all those subsamples allows us to kind of average out what the needs of your landscape are going to be. Uh, we do want that soil to be dry. Uh, we are going to wind up mailing it, so having all that water in it and everything else can be a problem. Uh, we're going to need about a pint of the soil total. So what I do is I just mix all my subsamples into a bucket, mix that around really good, uh, take a pint of that into a bag, just bring that right into the office. And there's a form to fill out that just includes your information and what you're trying to grow. Uh, we mail that off to the Mississippi State University Extension Surface Soil Testing Lab, uh, and they will return with results uh, that indicate everything that we need to know to properly fertilize our soils. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do here uh, to uh, make this just a little bit easier to understand uh, is I'm actually going to share my screen um, and so what that will allow me to do is show you uh, first of all uh, this is the extension.msstate.edu website, the website for Mississippi State University Extension uh, and this is the soil testing page. Um, so you can go to our website uh, search for soil testing right in this box right here uh, and it's going to bring up this page um, and you can see directions on how to take a soil sample. Uh, you can figure out and you, know, you can actually pay online for them now rather than bringing a check or a money in order into the office. Um, you can pull up an example of the form here. Um, and I'm just going to bring that up for convenience. You can see this is the form you pull out. What you want to do here um, is give the sample a name, uh, and then you can look at all of the different crops that can be grown that we can provide fertilization recommendations for. Uh, so that's what you're going to want to fill out in order to get your soil test. Uh, what you're going to wind up getting back is going to be a response like this. Now this is a homeowner level result. Uh, we do also have soil tests uh, for large areas or for commercial uh, production. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this one today, other than to show you the difference. Uh, this sample assumes that you are planting on a one acre basis. 
So all of the recommendations they're going to give you are based on one acre. Uh, for the homeowner level, the recommendations are for a thousand square feet, uh, which for most gardeners is going to make things a lot uh, easier to deal with. Um, so uh, this is a soil testing result that uh, I sent in uh, primarily to use as an example. Uh, you can see the crop that I'm growing there is going to be annual flowers and herbs. Uh, and it shows uh, some really important information right here at the top uh, is my soil pH. We're going to talk about that here in just a second. Uh, it, may, it gives the levels of some really important plant nutrients that we need, a phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium. Uh, but the, the really sort of the, the you know, bottom line information that I want to know is that's great, but what do I need to do to fertilize in my landscape for this plant uh, right here and now, and when should I do it as well? Uh, and so you can see right here where it says soil test results indicate, uh, and here it's going to say the pH of soil is slightly acid. No lime is recommended for this crop. So I don't need to lime this ground. If it did have a lime recommendation, it would provide me an amount of lime that I need to apply per thousand square feet. Uh, if you can look at this commercial one right there, it recommends lime, and it's recommending a ton to the acre. Um, going back to the homeowner test, uh, it's actually showing me the dates that I should fertilize right here. So March 1st and April 1st, May and then August 1st. And then it gives me the rate and type of fertilizer. So the directions are to apply one and a half pounds of 3400 fertilizer uh, on those dates. And if I can follow this, those instructions, I'm going to wind up doing a really good job of taking care of my plants. Now, one thing that I do like to mention to people uh, when I uh, talk about the uh, uh, soil test and the results you get back, uh, sometimes the fertilizer recommendation may be a little bit difficult to find. Uh, you may not be able to find a particular fertilizer. Uh, and in that case, give your county extension office a call, uh, contact your local county extension agent by email. Um, we'll be able to bring up a copy of the soil test if it was done in the county that we work in. If not, just take a picture of it and send it to us or uh, let us know what the results are. Uh, and what we can do is we can look at the components of that fertilizer and maybe recommend another strategy or another product that you can use in order to provide all of the nutrients that you need. Uh, so I want to go back and I want to just kind of explain a few things about what's going on in the soil uh, and what these things that we're adding to our soil do. So pH is really important for proper fertilization. And pH is really just a scale from generally 1 to 14 uh, that measures the acidity or alkalinity of your soil. 7 is neutral, I'd be distilled water. Uh, anything lower than seven, 7 is an acid, and anything higher than that is alkaline or a base. And what we're normally looking for for growing vegetable gardens uh, is a pH somewhere between 6 and 6.5. Uh, just be aware that there are a few plants that like pHs that are different than that. A good example is uh, our blueberries or azaleas that tend to like more acidic pHs. Um, and cactuses which tend to prefer more alkaline pHs. So what's really going on is the pH is a measure of hydrogen ions that are present in the soil and it affects the availability of other plant nutrients to be able to take up, be taken up by the plant. You can see a chart there uh, that shows the sort of the, the you know that area of a pH of 5.5 .5 to 6.5 and you can see the different nutrient availabilities at different pH levels. You can see right in that area, it's kind of the ideal area for where we're able to take up nutrients. So a lot of the plant nutrients are positively charged particles. So potassium ions or ammonium ions or calcium ions all have a positive charge, very much like that hydrogen ion would. And soil particles tend to have a negative charge. And as we all remember from the song, those opposites attract. 
So what we're interested in is the ability of those particles to get broken off away from the soil so that the plant can take care of them, can actually take them up. And pH really gets down to whether we can take up those nutrients or not. So areas like Mississippi, where we tend to have high rainfall, our soils tend to be acid. Uh, and because of that, we're often needing to add lime in order to make, it, make that soil pH change to a point that's best for plant growth. Uh, acid soils can lead to poor plant growth, uh, generally poor root growth, um, and we may wind up with nutrient deficiencies because of uh, soil pH, even if the nutrient is there in the soil. Um, because they have poor root growth, sometimes we may have uh, more damage from drought stress if the, if the soil pH isn't right. And again, as a rule, those soil pHs here in Mississippi tend to be more acidic. In fact, any area uh, in the southeastern United States, generally speaking, is going to have that acidic pH. Now, limestone is the most effective and inexpensive way uh, for us to adjust the pH of our soils. Uh, you'll often hear about two different forms of, uh, of lime, uh, either dolomitic or calcitic lime. Uh, and just to break that down really simply, Dolomitic lime includes magnesium, whereas calcitic lime doesn't. So what you want to look at really, you know, most of the time if you go to a garden store, they're just going to have dolomitic lime. Perfectly okay to apply that even if you don't need magnesium. Um, but if you do need magnesium, you want to make sure you use a dolomitic lime in order to make sure we're providing that nutrient to the plant. So another important point about lime is we want to make sure that we're applying it in time. Uh, so lime is going to take time to react in the soil. It's going to need to dissolve and uh, interact with water in order to produce the change in pH that we want. So ideally, what I'd like people to do is take those soil tests a couple of months before we actually intend to plant. That's going to allow you to have a lot of lead time Make sure you have all the fertilizer you need. Make sure you're going to be able to fertilize on the right date. Make sure you can go ahead and integrate that lime, get it to react, and have the, the response that you want there in the soil. Uh, you want to apply lime evenly, work it into that top four to five inches of soil. That's really going to help it react faster. Uh, and make sure you mix it completely because we don't want to wind up with one area that has a different pH than another. It might confuse our future soil tests. Uh, lime is going to have other benefits. It is going to improve the structure of clay soils, make them easier to work. Uh, we are going to need to lime again after a period of time because different fertilizers may be slightly acidic. Uh, even rainfall can slowly cause the, uh, the soil to slowly be more acidic over time. So you really need to do that soil test on a, on a, a yearly basis. Uh, I recommend doing it on a seasonal basis. Uh, so if you're planting in the spring and in the fall, I prefer you to do two soil tests if you can, uh, if not, at least one a year. Uh, and do keep in mind that if you have a really sandy soil, it's likely to become acidic faster than a clay soil will. So we've talked a good bit about lime. Now I want to spend a little bit of time talking about fertilizer. Uh, and there are a lot of different fertilizer products out there. Uh, all sorts of different formulations for, for you. And normally when we describe a fertilizer, what we do is we describe it by what's called the NPK number. Uh, and NPK stands for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, and the numbers that you see are a percentage. So if you look at 13, 13, 13 fertilizer, that product is going to have 13% nitrogen, 13% phosphorus, and 13% potassium by weight. Uh, so if you buy 100 pounds of it, 13 pounds of that is actually nitrogen. And 13 pounds is phosphorus, and 13 pounds is potassium. Similarly, if you buy a 0060, there's no nitrogen and no phosphorus, but 60% by weight is going to be potassium. So uh, keep in mind what those numbers mean, 
And what that can give you the ability to do is, you know, you, you have a recommendation for triple 13, uh, but you have some triple eight on hand or 888 fertilizer instead of 131313 13 fertilizer. Uh, what you can do is figure out the ratio between the, the nutrients that are available there uh, and just uh, apply this other fertilizer uh, to make sure that you're applying all the correct nutrients. One of the things that I frequently do for people when they call in or send me an email is I break down the actual poundage of nutrients that they need. Uh, and maybe sometimes I can find a way for them to use a fertilizer that they have on hand uh, or that might be cheaper for them to purchase. So another advantage of calling your county extension office. So I want to take just a second and mention what those nutrients are doing for the plants in the soil. Uh, nitrogen, of course, really important nutrient, one of the three uh, macronutrients for the plants. Uh, and it is really important in the formation of proteins and enzymes, uh, really important in the formation of chlorophyll, which is, of course, the molecule the plants need in order to absorb light uh, and make energy. And when we, want, when we wind up with a deficiency of nitrogen, uh, you can see the image down there in the bottom. That plant just looks a little bit yellower. The, you know, the one on the left looks yellower than the one on the right because it has that nitrogen deficiency. And often... We're going to see the younger leaves, the newer leaves, actually remain a little bit green, more green longer because nitrogen is very mobile within the plant. So the plant can take it from one part of the plant to another part of the plant to supply it to that new growth. You know, the, the older part's always trying to take care of the younger part. That's absolutely true in plants. Uh, phosphorus, uh, really important in the formation of the nucleic acids. We need it for RNA and for DNA. Uh, it's very important as an energy uh, molecule, so ATP and NADP are the, uh, the start of the energy cycle when we're uh, trying to uh, accomplish something in biology. Uh, where we have a phosphorus deficiency, we'll often see a plant that's stunted. Uh, very often it'll have a really dark green color, uh, and occasionally we will wind up with some sort of dead spots, what we call necrosis on the plant. Again, because that nutrient's really mobile, we tend to see those uh, symptoms on the older leaves faster than we see them on the younger leaves. Uh, similarly, potassium, uh, really important in maintaining turgor pressure. That's that water pressure that's holding the plant upright. Uh, and does a lot of important signaling and transporting across cells in the plant. Uh, and when we wind up with potassium deficiencies, we wind up with older leaves dying. Uh, or that marginal necrosis, that dying around the edge of the plant, again, starting out on the older leaves. We occasionally do see this uh, on a number of plants, and uh, a lot of the soil tests that we get back do need a, a requirement for potassium, at least down here in South Mississippi. So uh, now we know what's in the fertilizer in terms of the nutrients we're supplying. We can also look at whether we are getting organic fertilizer or inorganic fertilizers, and often we'll refer to it as organic versus mineral fertilizer. So when we look at an inorganic fertilizer, uh, very often these are relatively simple molecules. So they break down really quickly. They tend to be pretty dense in terms of how much of the particular nutrient it is, is in there. So things like potassium nitrate or ammonium nitrate, calcium nitrate, uh, urea or su the superphosphates, calcium chloride, uh, very simple molecules. Now, uh, when we look at organic fertilizers, these are going to be materials that occur regularly or naturally in nature, uh, often as the byproduct or end product of some natural process. So manure would be a really good example of that. Uh, in addition, we may also have some, some actual mineral materials uh, like limestone or rock uh, phosphate or saltpeter. Uh, when we look at the components of organic fertilizers, now we have things like fish emulsion, which tends to be high in nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, fish meal, uh, really traditionally used as a first uh, fertilizer before we really had uh, synthetic sources, a lot of nitrogen, a lot of phosphorus, uh, bone meal for phosphorus and calcium, uh, bat guano is a really interesting one. It contains all of the major macronutrients, or nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. 
Uh, if you go back in history, there are actually wars fought over bat guano for all of the important things that you could make with it. Uh, so all of these are going to be relatively complicated uh, molecules, so they tend to break down a little bit slower. Now, the advantages of using a mineral or an inorganic fertilizer is that, you know, it's really easy to go down to the store and buy them. Uh, you don't have to go very far. Uh, they tend to be relatively inexpensive. Uh, they're simple to apply because you, they're really nutrient dense. And, of course, one of the things I like about them is I know when I'm using that mineral fertilizer exactly how much nutrient I am applying. Um, and, again, we're, we're just not spending quite as much money. Uh, that being said, there are some disadvantages of mineral fertilizers. And part of that is that sometimes mineral fertilizers, particularly if they're over applied, can run off from where we apply them, can leach out of the soils in response to water movement, and wind up in water downstream. Occasionally, there are some impurities in uh, inorganic fertilizers. It takes a really, really long time for that to be serious and build up to a level that's important, but it's a concern for some people. And oftentimes, the uh, inorganic fertilizers can lead to soil acidification, which means we're going to need to apply lime again. Um, oftentimes, with our mineral fertilizers, we're not including some of the trace minerals that are required by plants, things like iron and boron, uh, manganese, and, and other elements that the plants don't need in large numbers. And because of that, the plants may have a deficiency in one of those trace minerals after some time. Uh, occasionally, we can oversupply those nutrients. We want to watch out for that. We don't want to apply more fertilizer than we have to. Uh, and we also want to look after the impacts that these uh, inorganic fertilizers may have on the good fungi and good bacteria that live in the soil. Uh, mycorrhizae are a really good example of that. Uh, mycorrhizae are fungi that are associated with the roots of plants. Um, they actually uh, incorporate right along with the root, and they help the plant take up the nutrients from the soil. Uh, and the presence of these mycorrhizae is incredibly important to plant growth. You can see the picture there in the bottom right of a plant grown with and then without those mycorrhizae. And the one grown with it is, is again, a much larger, uh, much larger plant, much healthier plant. So we want to protect those mycorrhizae as much as we can. So getting to organic fertilizer, there are some advantages of organic fertilizer. So nutrients are going to be, generally speaking, uh, in larger, more complicated molecules. They're going to break down more slowly in the soil, uh, which means you're, you're not getting a big burst of that nutrient to the plant all at once, but that nutrient is going to be available there for the plant long term. You're promoting good soil microorganisms. You're actually helping populations of bacteria and mycorrhizae. Uh, you're adding in organic matter, uh, just as we talked about, uh, uh, you know, soil structure and adding organic matter to correct clay or sandy soils. An organic fertilizer is going to help with that. And, you know, a lot of people are interested in this as a long-term sustainability or environmental impact factor. And so... Uh, there's there's a, a trade-off to be made. Um, there are absolutely advantages to it, um, but re it's really important if you're looking at this in terms of an environmental benefit that we need to be getting that organic fertilizer locally. So if you have to go all the way to Oklahoma to get it, the the shipping that you're uh, you're doing uh, in order to uh, uh, get the organic fertilizer to you, the fact that you're going to require a, a large truck to move all the fertilizer you need um, can make that a little bit less advantageous. So uh, there are again some disadvantages. We do have a difficulty because if we have a load of, uh, of cow manure or some other product, uh, it's a little bit difficult to know exactly how much of the nutrients we're applying when we apply them. We, we might not know how much nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium is in that fertilizer. Um, they tend to be fairly uh, low concentration, so 244 as opposed to 20-20-20. Um, so oftentimes, we're going to have to put down a large amount of that fertilizer 
in order to provide all of the nutrients that we need. And there's a lot of cost that's associated with transporting them, with applying them, uh, and just purchasing them. So uh, we also have some issues with contaminations, potentially with weeds or insects. And, and if you apply them, it's still possible for nutrient leaching to occur. And I have been talking about soils for a while, uh, and so I always like to include a slide where we can just look at some beautiful plants uh, to remember that the reason we're doing all this uh, is because we want to grow uh, productive and beautiful gardens. Uh, so just a moment of color before I continue on. Uh, so just a brief note on avoiding some soil problems. Uh, one thing that we do want to avoid is soil compaction. Uh, we don't want to reduce pore, sp pore spaces in the soil. Plants actually need air uh, down in that so soil, both to allow the roots to grow out and because the, the roots take in air in order for them to break down those sugars to produce energy. Uh, we want to make sure that we have good drainage, uh, you know, till the soil, uh, use organic matter for clay soils to allow good drainage to occur, uh, use organic matter in there to uh, uh, provide nutrients, to provide uh, uh, good space for beneficial organisms, yeah. correct those sandy and uh, uh, clay soils. Uh, and then if you're not actively using your soil, it's a good idea to cover it over uh, just to prevent erosion and the loss of organic matter. All right, just to, I'm going to really quickly go through some components that we see in, in media rather than native soil. Uh, oftentimes, uh, peat is one of those media that we uh, look at and bringing in or using to construct a soil. Uh, commonly use this in uh, nutrient or greenhouse mixes. Uh, you can see how they harvest it. Uh, basically, it's, it's decomposed plant material, so they just harvest it in blocks. Uh, and there are several different kinds of peat. Most commonly, what we're using is peat moss. Uh, you can see a, a pile of it down there in the bottom in, image. It's, it's not very heavily uh, decomposed. It tends to be really light, brown in color, and it really holds moisture very well. Uh, one thing that can be a problem with it is that if it's gotten really dried out, it, it, peat is actually hydrophobic, uh, so it can be hard to wet it again. Uh, material that's become more popular recently uh, is one called Cor, uh, spelled C-O-I-R. Uh, it's actually made from coconut fiber, uh, and it is a potentially more sustainable replacement for uh, peat moss. Uh, looks just like uh, sphagnum peat. Um, oftentimes you'll find it uh, in these little discs uh, and you use that for starting seed uh, very successfully. Uh, doesn't break down quite as much and it's a lot easier to re-wet. Again, it's made from essentially a waste material, uh, so it's a little bit more environmentally friendly. Uh, a lot of the materials we use are in, in constructing soil are made of essentially pine bark and other softwood barks, uh, make up anywhere from 80 to 100% of a lot of our container mixes. Uh, we prefer this over hardwood bark because it tends to be resistant to decomposition. Uh, there's less heavy tannins and other things in it that might uh, be a problem. Uh, and generally speaking, we're going to have that pretty finely screened down uh, to produce a fine medium for plants to grow in. Uh, we do want to use ideally composted pine bark. Uh, it only takes uh, five to seven weeks to do that, um, and it's going to have a lot better response in terms of the plant growth. Um, there are some inorganic materials that we'll often see in our uh, soil mixes as well. Uh, if you open up a bag of potting media, you'll see some little white uh, material in there. Uh, that is perlite. It's included in as a spacer. Uh, to uh, help drainage and to improve aeration in soils. Uh, occasionally, we'll also use a material called vermiculite for essentially the same purpose, um, but it does also hold nutrients. Again, we see that in a lot of container mixes. And I am going to uh, have this, uh, I'm going to post these, res uh, these recipes up on my Facebook page because I've had several people ask, them, ask for them. And these are just some soil mixes that can be used. This one is for woody ornamentals, uh, container-grown uh, plants or raised beds. Uh, you can see it's, a, it's mostly pine bark mulch or composted pine bark. 
um, six parts that to one part sand, uh, and then a mixture of lime and fertilizer to provide all of the nutrients needed for the plants. Uh, and then we have a mix for tender annuals and container gardening. Uh, so this would be the mix that I would use for vegetables. Again, a large part of that is a softwood bark or pine bark, 80%. Uh, and then peat or core would both be acceptable to make up the remainder of the material. Uh, and then again, the same mixture of limestone and nutrients uh, that you need in order to provide all of the nutrients that the plants need. Um, so 